Hey everybody, and welcome to this, my second of two videos on the Minolta X600. A rare but very interesting camera. So, we're going to, in the first video we talked about what everything is. In this video we're going to talk about what it does and how to use it to take photos. First thing though, this camera can do nothing at all without batteries. No functions on this camera will work without them. So let's get this battery chamber open very cautiously because I don't ever want to have to replace that. We're going to grab two AAA batteries and we're going to put them in to the battery chamber. Oh, that's much easier than the AL one. We're going to slide this shut and the motion for that is you want to pull the release back, push the camera door in and then push the release closed so that you protect that release and lock. And now we have power and we are ready to start using this camera. Next, let's talk about mounting and unmounting lenses. Here's the lens release button. You're going to push it in, rotate counter or anti-clockwise, and then lift the lens off. Lens index, lens index. To mount the new lens, you simply line up those two indices and then turn clockwise until it clicks into place. And now you've mounted your lens. That's it. This, this lens has the MD auto exposure um, lock for program mode on the X700. That does not work with this camera. So uh, you are using aperture priority or full manual mode with this camera. Next, let's talk about how to load film in this camera. We're going to open the film back, just like that. We're going to grab our roll of 35 millimeter film and drop it in. Pull out a liter. We're going to feed the liter into this take-up spool right here. And we're going to see if I can actually do this. Ooh, nice. That worked for a change. There we go. Close the film back. We're going to set the ISO dial to the correct speed. We put in 400 ISO film, so we're going to adjust that to 400. This is marked ASA, but ASA and ISO are the same number. 400 ISO film is the same as 400 ASA. When ISO took over film ratings from ASA, they kept the ASA numbering and the DIN numbering, and that's why modern films say 400 ISO and um, 27 degrees, which is 27 DIN. So after we have loaded the film, we're going to make sure that that starts to turn red. We're going to look here on the frame count window, and we're going to advance three times until we get to frame one, just like that. Now you might have noticed that this was spinning. You want to make sure that you have taken the, t uh, the slack out of the film. You don't want to crank this, but you just want to crank it until it stops. And then you'll know that the film's moving through the camera if this turns while you're advancing the film. The reason for that is because the film is taken up on the sprocket here. It's pulled through the camera. The film's connected to the spool inside the cassette, and that spool inside the cassette is connected to this film rewind knob with a couple of forks. We'll see that when we take the film out. So you're going through your day and you're taking your photos and everything's going great and you're going to reach the end of the film. When you reach the end of the film, you need to rewind it. Rewinding it's very simple. You push the film rewind button down and then you grab this rewind knob and you rewind. Before we do that, I'm going to show you what happens inside your camera when you have film in it. Film is one and done. It can record light one time in a controlled manner with a proper aperture and shutter speed that give you an image on that film or in an uncontrolled manner by absorbing every photon that reaches it by doing this. If you open up your film, film back with a film like this, all of these images are erased. They're ruined. They, you won't get anything but pure blackness from them. If you pull your film out of the cassette, and then try to use it, you won't. You will have pre-erased all of your images. Once film is exposed to light in this way, it's ruined. So let's see how film moves through this camera when we take pictures. When you, act it, when you take the picture, then you advance the film, and you can see how it's taken up on this spool here, pulled by the film tension sprocket here across the shutter opening out of the cassette.
To rewind film, again, keeping the film back closed, you push the film rewind button and then just start rewinding. And this is what happens inside the camera when you rewind film. And actually, you don't even have to hold the rewind button on this model camera, which is nice. When you get to the end, you're going to hear a sound as the um, film is pulled off of the take-up spool. And that's audible outside of the camera. When you hear that, just rewind three or four more times and rewind until there's no leader left on the camera. I need to use this again for future videos, so I'm going to leave a little bit of a leader. You then remove your film, grab your next roll of film and pop it in, or if you're done for the day, you trigger your shutter, close up your camera, and turn it off. I talked about a couple of forks here. You can see those forks right there. They connect to the inside of the spool uh, on the, in the film cassette right there. And that's how you can rewind the film with this rewind knob. And that's also why this spins as film is taken out of the cassette so that you know film is actually moving through the camera by the rewind knob being turned uh, as the film is advanced. All right. Next, let's talk about how to use a flash with the Minolta X600. All right, first thing is you're going to have to connect it to your flash hot shoe because that's the only way for a flash to be triggered. Next, we're going to sh set the shutter speed to 1 60th, which is red, telling us that's our flash sync speed. We could also set it to 1 30th or anything slower. I'll explain why in just a second. 1 60th is the fastest shutter speed we can use a flash with this camera. The reason for that is because let's pretend that what you're seeing right now is what's going to reach the film. You have your shutter curtains here represented by my hand. At 1 60th of a second you take a photo, the first curtain travels. When that first curtain reaches the far side of the shutter opening, the flash fires. The, sh the, the film is open to light for around about a 60th of a second and then the second curtain closes, and when you advance the film, they reset. So if you're taking a half second exposure, the first curtain opens. When it reaches the far side of that shutter opening, the flash is triggered. Around about a half second later, the second curtain closes, and then you advance the film. Okay, what if you're at 1 1,000th of a second? The shutter speed is not governed by how fast the curtains move, but by the gap between them. So the first curtain opens, and then a thousandth of a second later, the second curtain comes in behind it. This curtain finishes its travel. The flash illuminates. What's between the curtains is lit up. What's blocked by the second curtains, second curtain will not record any light. So your negative will come back with a thin strip of light over here, where the flash illuminated it and darkness where the curtain was covering the negative. So anything faster than 1 60th of a second, and you'll get a partial frame. And that's not in all probability going to work for you. Some basic flash technique, which I apologize, will require you to turn your head sideways. Let us pretend that this is a flash and that we've mounted it on top of the camera. You're gonna take a flash photo and when you do, the light from the flash leaves the flash, reaches your subject, comes back, and reaches your lens. The result of this particular flash subject lens arrangement is to make your subjects look flat and waxy. It's a very unflattering look for every subject. So if you're going to use a flash on top of the camera, what you want to do is get one that has an articulating head. So you can tilt it up and down, preferably also rotate it, but at minimum, tilt it up and down. The reason is because you want to bounce the light from the flash off the ceiling. The light from the flash will leave the flash, reach the ceiling, reach your subject, bounce back to your lens. And that's a more natural and better look because if you think about it, whenever we see any subject outside, underneath the sun, indoors, underneath lights, or on the street, underneath street lights, let's say, we always see subjects lit from above. So our brain says that's normal and natural. That's flattering. Lighting from above is flattering and looks, makes things look good. You want to mimic lighting that makes your subjects look good when you have a flash. So having your flash 
bounce off the ceiling and back down, sets you up to have more flattering light. If you don't have a ceiling, then what you want to try to do is bounce it sideways off of a wall. Another thing you can do for even more control is if you have an RF adapter, plug it in here into your flash, you can handhold your flash. Although that, that's admittedly easier to do with an autofocus camera, which this is not. Alternately, you can get what's called a flash bar. Screws into your camera, screws into your flash. This connects either with a wire to a hot shoe to PC port adapter here, or with that radio frequency connection. And then it triggers your flash when you, you take a photo, but your flash is in a position where you can rotate it, or, um, just, or even if you shoot portrait mode like this, because there's a greater distance here, you've set yourself up for better success. So realistically, there are, you can spend your entire career as a photographer learning about flash use and never master it. So those are just a couple of basics, and the, the best thing you can do to use a flash effectively is have it mimic natural lighting conditions. Let's go through everything that we've learned and take a photo with this camera. The first thing is, we're gonna, there's two modes in which you can shoot this camera, full manual and automatic. In automatic mode, we want to adjust this dial here the shutter speed dial until we get to automatic mode. In automatic mode, you're gonna look through the viewfinder and at the top right of the viewfinder, you're gonna see the letter A that tells you you're in auto mode. When you, have to press, when you have to press the shutter button, there's going to be a light next to a shutter speed that's gonna tell you what your shutter speed is based on your aperture. You can adjust that shutter speed by adjusting your aperture. Basically, this is aperture priority shooting. You set the aperture, your camera will pick the best shutter speed for that aperture. Then you take your picture and advance your film. In manual mode, what you do is you set it to a speed and you're going to set your aperture. When you set your aperture, you will see an M in the top right corner that will tell you you're in manual mode. And then you'll see a solid light telling you what your shutter speed should be and a blinking light telling you what it is. So we're in 1 15th of a second right now. If our shutter speed should be 1 500th, we'll know and we'll adjust this until the blinking light is in line with the solid light. Take our picture, advance our film. So the basic process is you dial in your settings, aperture or aperture and shutter speed, focus to get your subject in focus, take your picture, advance. Really simple, really basic, and of course, you'll have focus confirmation with your lens. The way that focus confirmation works on this camera is that there's a little rectangular bar in the middle of the viewfinder. What's in that bar will give you focus confirmation. Along the bottom of the viewfinder, there's a green circle with two red triangles that point towards it. They're never all going to be illuminated at the same time. So if the focus triangle, the red one, on the right side of your frame is illuminated, what that means is that let's say that your actual focus is 1.2 meters, you might be focused at 0.8 meters. It means that your lens is focused closer than the subject is. All right, so if the red triangle on the left side is illuminated, that might mean that your focus point is 1.2 meters, but your lens is focused at three meters. Your lens is focused past your subject. When you are focused at 1.2 meters and your subject is at 1.2 meters, a green circle in the middle will illuminate. That's how the focus confirmation works. So all you need to do when you're taking a picture is dial in your settings, focus until you get focus confirmation, compose your image as you want it to be composed, take your picture, and advance and move on to the next. Really simple, really basic process. What about double exposures? Double exposures are definitely doable with this camera, and I'm gonna show you how to do them in both full manual mode and automatic mode. Let's talk first about the physics of the double exposure. You've got your film here, it's in, this, in the camera, and it's going to record your double exposure. If you have a single exposure that has a proper shutter speed of 1 125th of a second and f5.6, 
and you record a frame with that much light, it will be properly exposed and have a proper amount of density, is what they call it, to make a good negative. If you do a double exposure with twice as much light, your negative will end up being what's called dark, thick, or dense. There are three words that mean the same thing, which is that you have too much light and your negative is darker than it should be. If you're printing it in a dark room, you'll have longer print times and reduced contrast. If you're scanning it, you'll have reduced contrast and increased digital noise. So you want to try to avoid overexposing your frame when you do a double exposure. So what you want to do is for each of your two exposures, cut the amount of light reaching the film in half. Okay, so how do we do that? It's really easy in manual mode. 1 1 25th and F5 6 is a single proper exposure. These are fractions, so we just have to cut the amount of light in half, and knowing that they're fractions tells us which way to go. Half as much light as 1 1 25th is 1 2 50th. 1 250th of a second is twice as fast, or half as much time, as 1 1 25th. Again, we have an app. The aperture here has fractions. F5 6 is twice as much light as F8. So if you want to underexpose one stop for a double exposure, you can either set your shutter speed to one stop faster or your aperture to one stop smaller. Let's go to 1 250th of a second, take our first photo. Okay, wait, if we advance it, all we've done is take a single photo that's now underexposed. So we take our first photo, we hold the film rewind button down, we hold the film rewind knob in place, and then we advance, and that rearms the shutter without the film moving. Next, we take our second exposure, and we advance. Then we take our third one, right, and just keep moving. No, we don't. We're not done yet. We're going to set this to 1 1,000th of a second, and we're going to put the lens cap on, and then we're going to set this to f22 or f16, whichever, uh, depending on your lens. You're going to set it to the smallest aperture and we're going to take a dead frame. Then we're going to advance. Now the reason that we take a dead frame is that when you've taken your double exposure and you advance after it, the gearing that advances the film doesn't engage instantly. So the film doesn't move instantly. So it takes a partial frame for the film to start moving. If you take another exposure, it's going to partially overlap your double exposure, potentially an in all, in all probability, ruining both of them. So when you take the dead frame, that finishes advancing the film past the shutter opening so that your next frame doesn't ruin your double exposure and your next frame. Okay, so what about double exposures in auto mode? Is that possible? It sure is. In auto mode, it's actually a little bit easier. What we're gonna do is we're gonna set the aperture to whatever we want it to be. Now we're going to trick the camera into giving us a one-stop faster shutter speed because if we just adjust the aperture to f8, what's going to happen is the camera is going to compensate the shutter speed. So we're going to go with the aperture we want, and then we know we have 400 ISO film in the camera. We're going to set this to 800 ISO. 800 speed film requires half as much light as 400. So if you took two exposures set to 800 on the same part of film with the same part of 400 speed film, you'd have one properly exposed double exposure. Take our first photo, hold all the buttons in place, advance the film, take our second photo, advance, set this to a manual shutter speed dead of 1 1,000th, dead frame, now we want to make sure we go back to 400 ISO, otherwise all the rest of our single exposures will be underexposed one stop. And that's how you do a double exposure with this camera in automatic mode. And that's it. That is everything that we had to go over with the Minolta X600. And if you are fortunate enough to have one of these, uh, they are definitely a joy to use and a a challenge to find in good working condition for the Avid Minolta collector. Thank you for watching this video. Please give me a thumbs up. That lets me know that I'm on the right track producing content which is useful and helpful to you. If you have any questions or comments, please leave those in the comments section below. I'm pretty good about checking these every couple of days and answering questions. 
if you have any suggestions or ideas for future videos. And if I have the technical know-how and equipment, I'm more than happy to make those. One last thing, thank you everyone for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. I gotta get up, Steinbeck. I have to turn off the camera.